Bienvenue and welcome. The time has come for us to embark on a study of a celebrated filmmaker, a director whose current output is well-crafted, thoughtful, and, dare I say it, downright entertaining. That's right, it's time for us to talk about one Wesley Wales Anderson, better known to the general public as Wes. Are you ready? Three, two, one, blast off. The main reason I wanted to embark on a Wes Anderson O-Tour study is that I love Grand Budapest Hotel. It's my favorite movie of the past decade. But Hotel is a work from a fully formed artist, someone who's clearly at the top of their game. I'm hoping that, going through his filmography one by one, I'll be able to understand and appreciate Anderson's directorial style even more. Which brings us to Bottle Rocket. The film stars. Luke Wilson as Anthony, a young man recently released from a voluntary psychiatric unit. Owen Wilson as Dignan, Anthony's best friend and aspiring criminal. Robert Musgrave as Bob, Anthony and Dignan's friend who asks to join them in petty thievery even though he's from an incredibly wealthy family. Lumi Cavasso says Inez, a motel maid who is abruptly and persistently courted by Anthony while trying to do her job. And James Kahn as Abe Henry, the man who Dignan sees as his link to the criminal underworld. The film came out in 1996, and, watching it almost three decades removed, the most surprising thing about Bottle Rocket is that it didn't give the world one new talent, it gave us three. I spent the first 20 minutes of the movie pretty much shouting, Luke and Owen Wilson are so young, over and over. Once I got over my initial excitement, I realized that Owen Wilson is giving a fantastic and thoroughly unique performance. I don't think I've ever seen a character like Dignan on screen before or since. He's prideful, cowardly, and a complete innocent. But the movie never condescends to him. I think he's the primary reason Bottle Rocket works as well as it does. The humor also helps. It's a nice mix of wordplay and light slapstick. There are some broader jokes. Which part of Mexico are you from? Paraguay. Paraguay. But it's mostly listen closely or you'll miss them beats. It definitely shows you where Anderson's priorities are. He's not interested in scoring a laugh at the expense of the characters. He wants the humor to build on what the audience already knows about the character dynamics. A lesser comedy would sell out Dignan for laughs, but Anderson doesn't, thereby keeping the character's dignity intact. Take the scene where Future Man ridicules Dignan for looking like a little banana in his yellow jumpsuit. Anderson could have easily made Dignan's humiliation the source of the humor, but it's played fairly straight with Dignan reacting how most people would to a bully's taunts, ineffectually staring at his own feet. It's only afterwards when Anthony tries to cheer him up that the movie goes for humor. Did you see what he had on? Yeah, it's pretty cool. That's what's most enjoyable about Bottle Rocket. Even though Dignan and Anthony are deeply flawed and stuck in a state of arrested development, they're not in the movie to be mocked. Dignan, Anthony, and Bob, the third spoke on their aimless tricycle, are eccentrics. They have no idea where their lives are headed, even though Dignan has a ridiculous 75-year plan. But in my life, I find that the most boring people are the ones with their lives already figured out. I try to seek out the Dignans of the world because, frankly, they're more interesting to be around. However, audiences at the time were less enthused to hang out with the denizens of Anderson's first film. In Matt Zoller cites his terrific book, The Wes Anderson Collection, he sits down with the director to go through each of his films one by one. Wonder where he got that idea. While speaking about Bottle Rocket's initial reception, Anderson doesn't try to sugarcoat the circumstances. We had very bad test screenings, and when the movie was finished, we didn't get into any festivals. The whole thing was a disaster. By then, the Cinderella story was long over. Once we screened the movie for an audience and 85 people walked out, we knew the coach was about to turn into a pumpkin. At that point, the studio decided there wasn't going to be a premiere because they didn't want to waste any more money on it. Part of the joy of watching Bottle Rocket now is that, as a viewer, you know you're watching the first step of a long, critically acclaimed career. I don't necessarily blame viewers at the time for not knowing quite what to make of it. The plot's pretty thin and the main characters have muddled motivations. Dignan is a bit of a Don Quixote figure, but it's not clear why he chose to pursue the life of a criminal. Anthony is his Sancho, enabling his crime sprees, which result in increasing levels of danger. And Bob, as the only character with a car, would be Razanante if I can painfully extend the Cervantes metaphor. 
Why does Anthony enable Dignan? Why does Bob so willingly fall into a life of petty crime when he comes from incredible wealth? These questions are considered but never completely answered, and I could certainly see that driving audiences bonkers. Or maybe viewers thought that some of the scenes were just difficult to decipher. For instance, during the first scene at Bob's house, there's almost no attempt made to explain who Future Man is, why he's called Future Man, or why everyone's chilling at a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Side note about the casting in this movie. Future Man's played by the third Wilson brother, Andrew, and it's a little crazy that, out of Bottle Rocket's small cast, there are three real-life Texan brothers who don't play brothers in the movie. It's a detail that has the potential to be distracting, but I think all three actors work well in the movie, mostly due to the costumes and hairstyling. Compare Owen Wilson's blonde, high and tight haircut to Luke Wilson's flowing locks, or Owen's retro 50s leisure wear with terry cloth trim, to Luke's burnout chic with comfort fleece covering up his emotional scars. When Andrew Wilson shows up in his snooty rich guy duds, it's very easy for the audience to differentiate three characters who all have similarly symmetrical faces. I watched Bottle Rocket a couple of times, and the second time I just decided to let the plot glide over my head. That's the way to enjoy the movie. Once you stop worrying about plot and realize the characters are all fragile, directionless figures, then it becomes a great character study. Even though the story is thin, Anthony and Dignan have satisfying arcs. When Dignan declares, they'll never catch me, cause I'm fucking innocent, in the 2000 man chase scene at the end of the movie, it's a beautiful moment of clarity. It's him finally getting to be what he's pretended to be for the entire film, a leader. He's not going to leave a man behind because he's the architect of the heist and he's going to go down with his ship. Crucially, Anthony lets Dignan rescue Applejack. The rest of the movie, he's been protecting Dignan's emotional state by indulging in his criminal delusions. Letting Dignan run into the arms of the police, Anthony's giving up his watchdog role in Dignan's life. That leaves him open to other experiences. That leaves him open to love. Which brings me to the most egregious plot exemption, the lack of a proper conclusion to the Anthony Inez storyline. I definitely wanted another scene of the two of them reconnecting after the I love you exchange over the phone. Without it, their courtship scenes in the middle of the movie feel like a waste of time. I'm not really going to get into the problematic nature of a guy harassing a girl at her job until she agrees to go out with him, but it's certainly there if you want to criticize it. Nevertheless, while Dignan starts out as Don Quixote, he ends up as a responsible adult willing to atone for his crimes. Bob, well, Bob's getting along with Future Man a little better, I guess. Will we ever know why he's called Future Man? Also, it's worth noting that this movie probably wouldn't have been made if not for mega producer James L. Brooks and Polly Platt. You'll know Brooks from bringing little TV shows into the world like The Mary Tyler Moore Show and The Simpsons, and also from directing tiny movies like Terms of Endearment and Broadcast News. Brooks basically saw the original black and white bottle rocket short and decided to shepherd the feature length version through his production company Gracie Films. Brooks served as a mentor to Anderson during the making of Bottle Rocket, which he's notably done for two other filmmakers. Cameron Crowe for his directorial debut, Say Anything, and Kelly Freeman Craig for her directorial debut, The Edge of Seventeen. Wes Anderson and Cameron Crowe are now incredibly well-regarded filmmakers, give or take a little whitewashing and aloha. But if you want to see a more updated version of Bottle Rocket, it's definitely The Edge of Seventeen. The movie's also a bit of a structural mess with fascinating characters. Haley Steinfeld definitely gives off Owen Wilson-level idiosyncratic charisma in the movie, her character Nadine is disregarded by her family and the general public, but manages to forge her own future by being an unrepentant oddball. So that's my James L. Brooks' mentor double feature recommendation. Bottle Rocket and the Edge of Seventeen. Do it. Next up on our journey, drain a glass of scotch, light up a cigarette, and jump into the nearest swimming pool, because we'll be discussing Wes Anderson's Rushmore. And if you'd like more videos about directors both living and deceased, hit that subscribe button to stay up to date on this channel. And, as always, the Saris wheel spins on.